So the first story I want to start with is uh, that you know, I was typing a mail to my students with somebody in the audience. So, uh, so he sent me a manuscript and I read it and I wanted to make some comments about it. So I was typing this uh, uh, on my Gmail and you know. So as you can see, I mean, uh, as to what I could be thinking of writing. My task becomes easier, I just press the tab and the sentence is already complete. And then I, and then again he prompts me or suggests that I would be meaning this. Okay, so uh, I just hope you have experienced this. When you search for something as you scroll down, uh, somewhere here. Yeah, yeah. you know, Amazon comes up with suggestions that customers who bought this also bought blah blah. Okay. That's the second one. The third one, a while ago, uh, one of my friends from Italy wrote me an email which contained this phrase, he was referring to some movie and uh, he was referring to it by its Italian name, which I couldn't immediately uh, understand. But then I have Google, so I went to Google Translate. And what it tells me is that by the thieves would be the literal translation. Then I immediately realized that but the, the sort of official name of that movie is 1948 classic movie, if you are into movies you would have heard of it, is Bicycle Thieves. Okay. So, okay, so hold on to this story and let me go to something else. Now if I show you this, these pictures and ask you uh, out of these which one is a cat and which one is a dog, you probably think that I'm out of my who doesn't know what is, what is a cat? It's a dog. Uh, particularly when you see expressions like this, dog lovers know that only dogs can have such expressions. But then I, if I ask you the question that, you know, what kind of a butterfly is this? That question becomes a little more non-trivial in the sense that you have to know what kinds of butterfly there are and if you are not into sort of uh, biology or uh, a nature lover, you may not know these immediately. So this is something again my students sort of did. So he clicked this picture and then he wanted to know what kind of a butterfly this is. So what he did is, and I don't know how he did it, if you want to know, you can ask him uh, after this lecture, that he uh, searched it on Google and Google suggested that they, this could be one of these three types. Something about a modern butterfly, a mother tiger, and something in between. So you narrow down to three names. But the question is, why, are it, why am I telling you these stories? It's supposed to be a science talk. Uh, the question is, what is, is there something common to all of these? And if the answer is yes, and what is common to all of these is machine learning. So behind all of these, Google's suggestions, Amazon's recommendations, uh, Google translation, classifying pictures into dogs or cats, or what kind of a butterfly it is. Behind all of these, what is working is machine learning. Fine. Uh, what is machine learning? After all, I'm sure all of you have heard or read about it in some context or another. I mean, these days you open magazines, you open newspapers, and somewhere you see machine learning, artificial intelligence, you cannot escape this. So, what is machine learning after all? Okay. This is a cartoon, but you know, if you really try to understand this, at least my opinion is, it's not something as incongruous as this. Uh, well, it is a combination of some algorithms and some maths and some statistical ideas, but it probably looks uh, no, nicer than this. Okay, so formally, what is machine learning? Now, this is a very formal uh, definition of machine learning. 
It's a computer program, after all. It's a computer program that learns from experience. What is experience? It can mean different things in different contexts. Uh, but let's say you feel some data. So that's the experience. If it encounters data, that's more data, that's gaining more experience. Concerning some class of tasks, so it's trained to perform a certain task or a certain class of tasks, which are called T, and performance measure P. So when it learns a task, you test how well it has learned. So there is some performance measure which is called P. Now, given this scenario, you call that program a machine learning program if its performance in the task D, if its performance in doing tasks in T, as measured by P, improves with experience. So if you fill in more data, if you train it more, its performance improves. Now, machine learning is not just one thing. There are several types of machine learning applied in different contexts. So I cannot go into uh, you know, really the technicalities of it most of the cases. I just try to give you an idea, a flavor of what goes on in different contexts. So broadly speaking, there are three types of machine learning. One is called the supervised learning, then the unsupervised learning, and Reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is like learning from your teacher. So the concepts are displayed in the context of human learning. When examples are given, your teacher teaches you in the class uh, with examples, and that's how you learn. So that's like supervised learning. And then uh, he or she tests how well you have learned through uh, exercises, exams. Then unsupervised learning. You, you pick up a book and you try to learn all by yourself. You learn math, so you pick up a book, you try to learn what uh, logarithm is, for example, without an aid from a teacher. So that's like unsupervised learning. And then there is something called reinforcement learning, which is like one fine day you are very excited uh, about your studies, you open your math book and you try solving the most difficult problem. And you don't know how to really go about it. So what you do is, uh, you make some steps, you go a few steps, and then maybe you realize that, well, this is working out well, or maybe it's not working out well. So you trace back, go two steps back, and try something different. And then eventually you solve it. So what is happening is that you're learning from your experience, you're learning from your mistakes. So that's a good analogy of what goes on in reinforcement learning. There are, there are two types of supervised learning. One is called uh, regression, the other is classification. So what is a regression? I'll explain uh, by giving examples. Suppose there's a company which sells something, maybe uh, whatever, some product. And like all companies, they spend a lot of money in advertising and they advertise on TV they advertise on radio, they advertise on newspapers, and there are different budgets for these advertisements. At some point, they want to know what, uh, which media, which media they should spend money on advertising. Should they spend more uh, money in advertising on TV or the radio or the newspaper? So how do they figure that out? So that's a good example of uh, application of regression model. So given so they have a lot of data saying that if these are the budgets, then this was the cell, if these are the budgets, then this was the cell. So that's the data. And on their data, they can train this regression machine learning models. So that given a new set of data, a new set of figures for different uh, budgets for these three media, they can predict what the cell would be. And of course, the target is to maximize that cell. So that's an example, a real life example of a of application of, of a regression machine learning model. Uh, one can ask, uh, you know, for example, uh, how is the stock market going to go today? Some of the interesting stock market. And serious people who spend a lot of time uh, doing this, they use machine learning predicting movements in stock markets. 
classification is like you you have an object and you want to uh, know whether it belongs to this class or that class. Many of you, maybe all of you, use Google Mail, for example. Like this is spam folder. So when a mail comes in, Google classifies it as a genuine mail or a spam. And what goes on behind is a machine learning. So it classifies a mail into spam or not spam. And more recently, it has come up with a multi uh, sort of class classification. But there is a primary folder, there is a promotion folder, etc. Et so these are all examples of classification classes that go on. So like pictorially, this is a classification problem. Given some samples that you have, you want to classify them as either in this or that. And any machine learning model, there is this, you know, this is a statistical model. So it cannot be exactly 100% accurate. So sometimes things are not. Uh, misclassified, the blues are uh, put in this class or the greens are put in this class. So some of your genuine mates may end up in your spam folder. So you know the person who sent you call you up and say please take your spam folder maybe it is not. And, so and regression is like you have some variable here and the value of the function. So you don't know what function it is. So what you want to do is what you assume that it's a it's a function of a variable or maybe more than one variable. In most real life cases, this y is a function of many variables. And you only have some examples. Given x1, x2, x3, etc., you have a value of y. So you only have this data. And using that data, which is called the training set, what you want to do is you want to come up with your best guess for this functional form, uh, which let us call y cap if you this. So that's your best guess given all the data you have. So given these data, uh, what you would like to do perhaps is to guess that the dependence is linear. Obviously it's not exactly linear. But that's the best case maybe you can come up with. And so you come up with this function by uh, fitting this data to a linear function. And then given the new data, new set of values of this one, etc. You come up with a prediction for the value of y to b. So that's a regression. Unsupervised learning, uh, a good example of unsupervised learning is what is called clustered. So to start with, you don't have any labels on your data. You have some data. Okay? Uh, then what you do is you want your machine learning model to classify them into separate classes. There are something more common among the objects in this class that between something here and something there. And what is this commonality? What is this similarity? Of course, we depend on what kind of data you have, what is the application and hand. And it's very difficult to sort of uh, generalize, I mean, uh, give a general definition of this, uh, in the non technical terms. But uh, I'll try to explain this in terms of an ex uh, example. Suppose, you know, millions of people are buying products, let's say from Amazon or some other <coughs> online seller. What they want to do is they want to classify these all these customers into different classes in terms of their interests, what sort of products they buy, what sort of products they search, uh, and what sort of products they rate, how they rate, and so on. So that uh, interests are similar between customers in one class that between customers in this class and that class. Then, at some point, if they want to come up with a campaign, uh, marketing campaign, then depending on what kind of product they are trying to sell, they may target specific classes of customers. Specific clusters of customers rather than doing a general campaign. And not just online sellers, they can apply to you know, any merchant uh, doing offline sales as well. And uh, you know, the same ideas can be applied to uh, fraud detection when you do online transaction, the financial institution, uh, if it's something very unusual, uh, may alert you that it may be a fraud transaction. Uh, and so on. So, so these are examples of unsupervised learning. And finally, reinforcement learning. And this kind of explains what the reinforcement learning is. There is a robot here. Okay? And it has a reward that if you can reach here, it will 
get this done. But on the way, there are um, you know pledges. These are files which can destroy it. So there are rewards and punishments, so there are positive rewards and negative rewards, and it has to be moved, go from one state to another, and the goal is to find the reach here. So how does it do? It makes it move. If it goes here, that's a positive reward. If it tries to go here, it's a negative reward. So it should do that. It should uh, trace back and, and go back and so on. So that's how these models are trained, and a very real life example of this kind of reinforcement learning is so the you know final goal in a reinforcement learning is to maximize the reward. And you all have heard of self-driving cars. These use this idea of reinforcement learning. So this car has to learn, or the software that runs this car has to learn that when it reaches an intersection and sees cars coming from this direction, it has to make a left turn, it has to wait before these cars go, and then only it can make a turn. Now, of course, I mean, when these cars are trained, of course, on day one, they cannot be uh, left on the streets because then you need to make a wrong move and hit people or hit some other cars. So these are extensively, these have to be extensively trained at the software level and in the lab in simulators before they are actually going. Okay, so those are all fun stories. Now, uh, let, let us look at some stories from science. So, one of my favorite examples is this drug design with this company. So, this was, a, this, was a, this was a story from early 2020. After that, it, it sort of um, got lost as the pandemic struck. So, it was covered in the uh, you know, global media in uh, February or March 2020. Is that a group of researchers from MIT and Harvard? They have developed a new antibiotic, which is called uh, Alicin, I think that is the name, which is very efficient in killing a large number of bacteria which are otherwise uh, in the existing uh, antibiotics cannot kill. So, what they used is a uh, kind of machine learning called deep learning, which is a kind of neural network. Have heard of neural networks. So what they did was they had samples, they have they had data, a few thousand antibiotics and their effect on various bacteria, and they used that as a training set to train, uh, to train this deep learning model. And then they had made various candidate materials, and out of these they found that what they call this alicin uh, molecule, it is very good at killing all the bacteria. And then they actually went to the lab and tested it. So imagine, so this drug design is a very expensive and time-consuming uh, affair. Okay, so instead of spending money, billions of dollars in experiments, or even very sophisticated calculations, what they could do is, is compared to those sophisticated calculations, this machine learning uh, exercises computation and much cheaper. It takes much less time. So they could identify one or few molecules which would be good at a task, and then they go and do this experiment. So that saves a huge amount of time and money. And uh, it's not that it's just going on in drug design, in various other fields of scientific research, materials research, this is the idea that is being formed. I'll uh, some, have something more to say about that. The other exciting area in science in research, where this uh, machine learning is being used, is what is called autonomous experiments. Now, what is your idea of experiments? That you know, the, the scientists who go to the lab, uh, do some experiments, maybe it's, it's a, you know, turn some knobs here and there, start something on, or pour some chemicals, and at the end of the day, or maybe several days, some results will come out, and then they will sit down and analyze it, and so on. That's the process that has been going on for a couple of centuries, maybe. But what if, uh, if we can automate this process? An analogy would be how we used to produce goods before the industrial revolution. Craftsmen would produce in their small labs. So each product would be 
dissimilar to others and not really really manageable and the process would be very slow. Now for the good or the bad, what the industrial revolution did was to automate these things. So it was the industrial revolution, then the concept of assembly line. Now we have identical products being manufactured at a huge pace. So what research is about is about generating new knowledge. And the idea here is that you can automate this knowledge generating process. So what you do is you initialize an experiment by, so you have an autonomous system, like a machine learning model. You fill in some initial data based on past experiments. And then it uh, itself plans what is the next experiment to be done. I'll show you a concrete example in the next slide. So it does the experiment, gets the result, then it analyzes that result. And uh, if required, it does some associated computation. Then it extracts the relevant information from that and updates this, this data, this, this knowledge representation goes to the next step and uh, decides about the next experiment that it has to do and this loop goes on before uh, or until a condition is met which is of course said by the human experimenter but this entire loop, maybe hundreds or thousands of experiments are done without any human intervention so this knowledge generation and representation and updating is done autonomously by this machine learning model and finally uh, the, the result comes up whatever the human experiment is looking for so it frees the human researcher of uh, you know, many imitative jobs so a concrete example is this this was actually performed you have some initial data which was fed to some machine learning model and the task here is to, so they were producing what are called carbon nanotubes. Okay, so these are, you know, tubes of sheets of carbon atoms. So the idea was to optimize the experimental conditions so that the uh, production of these carbon nanotubes is maximum. So uh, this uh, the initial data was fed to this machine learning model. So it decided on the next set of experiment that is next set of uh, synthesis conditions found out how at what rate these, uh, these nanotubes are being produced fed that information to the database then uh, sort of decided on the next experiment that is the next set of conditions under which the carbon nanotubes are to be produced and this is going on and on and at some point depending on whatever conditions they have to be they came up with the experimental conditions which maximizes the carbon nanotube production. So this is a concrete example where this autonomous experiment was performed uh, to maximize production of carbon nanotubes. Now, you know, it not just frees the human researcher of the utility jobs, it allows uh, the researcher to do such experiments even remotely. I mean, all you are doing is triggering a computer system there, the machine learning model, and the subsequent things are all done automatically. So even if you are physically somewhere else, you could just log into that computer and start that experiment, and it runs on its own. And maybe you just go on a vacation. Okay? You go on a vacation, you come back after seven days, and you, you have your research. So that's the level of flexibility this can be. And this is, I think, the final topic I, I, I want to uh, cover is uh, there is something called an autoencoder. Without getting into the technicalities of it, basically this is a combination of two neural networks. So the blues form one neural network, the, the yellows here form a neural network. And uh, what you do is you fill in an image here, which maybe is represented by a certain number of pixels like the points on which information is encoded in this, in this picture and uh, then uh, there is something called convolutional neural network don't worry about the name, don't worry about the technicalities 
if let's say your input pixel is a 64 by 64 pixel, if it reduces that in size, it reduces it to a smaller number of pixels, and there are different tools for doing that. And what this neural network does is to get it back to a 64 by 64 size, but as faithfully as possible to the initial image. Now, when you reduce the size, of course, you are using some information. So it is not likely that you will be able to reproduce the exact image. But the, the neural networks are trained in such a way that they can do this job as good and as well as possible. So the performance is to you know, reproduce or reconstruct this image as faithfully to the initial image as possible. So here are some examples. Okay. If you want to know more details about this, you can ask Sora. Uh, so you know these are the uh, uh, initial images, and these are the reconstructed images after going through this model. And there is a little variation of this auto encoder, which are called variational auto. -input. And what is the difference between an auto encoder and a variational auto encoder? It's the difference is between uh, the properties of this uh, central layer. Now, that difference is a little technical, so I won't get into that. Uh, but these are constructed slightly differently compared to the auto encoders. And what that does is, I mean, firstly, these are trained exactly as like auto encoders that, given an input image, this tries to reproduce. Uh, not uh, that image as painfully as possible. But then, uh, in this space, every point in that space becomes physically meaningful in terms of these images. So, given an image, it will be uh, mapped onto some point in this space. Another image will be mapped onto some any of the input images. Now, in variational autoencoder, this layer is constructed in, in such a way that even that point has a meaning in terms of these images. So what that does is, you pick up random points in this and then you can ask this neural network to reproduce that point as an image and it will do that and you will get meaningful images and this is an example of that. So this uh, variational autoencoder was trained to reproduce spatial images. So after training, Arbitrary points was uh, by picked up from this layer, from this space, and these faces were produced. Now, does any of this look like it's not a human face? It doesn't, right? They are all human faces. But none of these were actually present in the input images which were trained, uh, which were used to train this uh, auto variation of. So these images are newly generated. So what is the idea here? What is the relevance of this to, uh, let's say, our science research? What one can do is one can represent molecules or materials as images. And there are, you know, develop ideas that how to do that. Or, you know, people are still trying to uh, refine those ideas. But you can do that. And once you can do, once you can represent a molecule or a material as an image, you can train a variational auto encoder and then you can uh, try to generate new materials by taking new points in the central layer or the latent space, and which probably will have different properties or exciting properties which none of the existing materials that you do has. In fact, this is the very idea that is being now pursued in uh, drug design. And in fact, we are trying to explore this idea in materials. So, I've given you a sort of broad overview of various aspects of our modern life where machine learning is being used. Some of this I have uh, talked about, explained. And you can add to that uh, weather prediction. You have writing apps like when you book an Uber, for example. How, how does it decide which car should pick you up? There's some machine learning going on here. Uh, personalized education is a new area where machine learning is being explored. And 
Jira's design I already talked about. So with that, I'll uh, come to my last slide, that whenever you have a technology and something as powerful as machine learning, it throws up ethical questions. These are binary computers which is based on zero one the machine language but there is a concept of analog computers which was uh, used in the uh, Greece and Mesopotamian era so will it improve the technology because there are many research uh, for, which says it could um, improve the technology many folds I really want to know that All that I'm talking about is down the existing computers. Sir, is that variation or point that point from which the output image is made? Let me explain that uh, once more. So, first you have a set of input images with which you train this variation of auto encoder and the attempt as well as possible as output images. So that's the training part. After that, what you do is so each input image is uh, mapped onto some point in this layer. Okay. So let's say if you have a million images, there will be a million points onto which they are mapped in this layer. Now you take a point in that central layer, which is not one of these people, and then ask this part of the network to convert that to an image. These are those images. So these are new, new faces, which did not exist here. First of all, good morning, sir. So, sir, as you have proceeded, we asked about the discussion of can a machine learning be powerful. So, we, sir, we think about a self driving car that is working on the principle of artificial intelligence. Suddenly, so, our incident happened to get that a boy around a five year age comes in front of AI driving car. And in AI driving and self driving car, a person said, who is it not driving it but sit with it from going a place to place and there is a certain chance of accident. So what will be the drive car do? First chance is that the car will hit the ball and go on. And second chance is that the car will try to stay the ball and in the second case the incident of the man who is sitting in the car will be happen. So sir my question is that how would AI work on ethics? So I don't think AI will be as I say, I want uh, this is a very valid question, and uh, I don't think these questions should have one line answers. So, therefore, I'll uh, stop short of giving any answer to that. I'll only say that this is a very, very valid question. Yes. Yeah, please be free. I mean. If you have no questions now, uh, you can try to catch uh, Professor Sen during the day, or he has been referring to his uh, students. So, so, so maybe you can stand up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, please uh, catch them. Uh, so, uh, before we thank Professor Sen again, uh, the plan now is to go and see some of the facilities on campus. So first we will take you to the cluster, then the library, then the labs, and then on to lunch. Uh, so with that, let's thank Professor.